Well, hello everyone, and a very warm welcome to this sixth and final session in the 11th annual Refugee Law Initiative seminar series, run this year in partnership with the Platform on Disaster Displacement. I'm David Cantor, and as director of the Refugee Law Initiative, I'd like to take a minute at the outset to remind us all of the key concepts behind this year's seminar series on human mobility, natural hazards, and policy responses. As you may recall, each of the six sessions in this series approaches from a different angle, the question of how can law and policy engage with the impacts of natural hazards on human mobility? To set the scene, the initial two sessions explored, firstly, the concepts that we use to frame or understand patterns of human mobility in the context of disasters. And secondly, the empirical data on this issue. We then shifted to consider contemporary legal and policy responses to this particular strand of human mobility. Seminar three reflected on current global policy debates on human mobility in the context of disasters and climate change. By contrast, seminars four and five addressed legal and policy responses at the regional and national levels, looking respectively at the challenges posed first by internal displacement and secondly by cross-border mobility in the disaster context. Today, in this final session, we finish with the highly topical issue of the COVID-19 SARS pandemic as a particular kind of natural or biological hazard. We consider both its impact on and implications for the broader global trends and debates on human mobility that were addressed in previous sessions of the series. In particular, we ask, in a COVID-19 world, or even some future post-COVID-19 world, how will this global pandemic shape both thinking and policy on human mobility in the wider context of disasters linked to natural hazards? Our speakers today will start us off by presenting key perspectives on four quite different aspects of this issue, after which we're going to open up for broader discussion, questions and comments from other participants. Turning to the practicalities, each of the four speakers will have eight minutes for their presentation, and to save time in introductions, full speaker biographies can be seen by following the link in the Zoom chat box. During the session, please also pose your own questions and comments to the speakers by typing them into the chat box. Finally, please do remember to keep your microphones on mute and your videos off, unless you're a presenter, of course. The session is being recorded and the podcast should be available from next week on the RLI and PDD websites. To moderate this final distinguished panel, I'm truly delighted to hand over now to Professor Walter Kalin, who today represents our institutional partner in this seminar series, the Platform on Disaster Displacement. Walter, over to you. Thank you, David, and very warm welcome uh, to uh, everyone. It's really a particular pleasure for me to uh, be able to co-chair uh, this uh, seminar. I'm here in my capacity as envoy of the chair of the platform on disaster displacement. For those of you who are not familiar with PDD, we are a state-led uh, platform, presently chaired by Fiji, working on human mobility in the context of disasters and adverse effects of climate change. We are um, focusing on the implementation of so-called Nansen Initiative protection agenda, and we are trying to influence policy at global and regional levels with regard to helping people to stay, preventing displacement. This is about disaster risk reduction. This is about um, climate change adaptation, strengthening resilience. We're also working on helping people to move out of harm's way by opening migration pathways or planned relocation. And then, of course, very much on the protection of those who are uh, displaced. Uh, COVID-19 is a biological hazard. 
And as such, it is recognized by the Sendai Framework on Disaster Risk Reduction as a cause of epidemics, pandemics, which are drivers of disasters. We haven't been working a lot about uh, the issue, and that's why I'm so grateful to uh, my colleague uh, David Cantor and RLI to have organized um, this uh, session here to uh, hear about what four very renowned specialists are going to tell us. Let's uh, not lose time, let's get started. And I would like uh, to invite our first speaker, Dr. Paul Spiegel from John Hopkins University. We'll talk about pandemics, humanitarian emergencies, and forcibly displaced populations. And please do not forget to put your questions into the chat box. Over to you, Paul. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Walter, and thank you very much, David and colleagues, for the opportunity. I have eight minutes, of which I'm going to start right now. Um, so thank you. I'm going to talk about COVID-19 and humanitarian emergencies, specifically um, discussing some of the, our work on the Rohingya refugees as an example of what could occur. Next slide, please. So here is just a, um, I checked this yesterday. This isn't the OCHA um, website that talks about looking at countries with uh, humanitarian response plans to get an idea of how some of these countries that are affected by conflict um, are faring. But I think it's interesting to look at, but my, my main message of this talk is that unfortunately, um, the data are very poor. Next step, please. Next slide, please. So we undertook early on, very, very early on in April, I think of this past year, we um, wanted to look at the Rohingya refugees for a variety of reasons. It's a, it's a mega camp, uh, many, many people, incredibly high density. Um, there was elevated transmission previously with a diphtheria outbreak, and they had a relatively low capacity for treatment in terms of hospital beds uh, per population. Next slide, please. So we, we used data early on from, uh, from China and parts of Europe, and I think a little bit in, in the US very, very early on. And I think we've all seen how we learn over time and the data, are, um, the data and the modeling changes according to the data that are available. So we reckon very quickly that there would be a very, very high transmission scenario. And you don't need to necessarily, I won't go into the details, but just to say at the highest level out of 600,000 people, Within a very short period of time, nearly all of them would have been um, infected to a lower transmission of approximately 421 out of 600,000 people. So significantly high transmission. Next slide. And then we looked at, uh, I, I just didn't, I didn't want to put in too much data. So we looked at the increase in healthcare capacity and very, very quickly within on the high, in the high transmission scenario, we reckon within 30 to 100 days, the, the bed capacities, the current bed capacities in the hospital would be overwhelmed. Another slide that I didn't show is that we reckon, we estimated approximately 2000 people would die, which was a significant increase compared to um, pre-COVID situations. And we published this, I have it down on the Broadman Plus Medicine early on. Next slide, please. Now, what did happen? What if, oh, before actually I get to this, just to explain, we we did this, and then we did it for all the, with UNHCR for all the other refugee camps in the world. And the idea was to predict, um, or to it wasn't a prediction as much as different possible scenarios, and allow um, the NGOs, the UN, and the governments to prepare accordingly. And and they did in the Rohingya camps. They set up isolation centers. They increased the number of beds. But what's been very confusing, I would say, is, and this is a website that's uh, available right now, and I think I went on yesterday, and if you look at um, the, uh, you can't see my, my uh, but if you look at the red circles, um, we have Bangladesh, the host community in Cox's Bazaar, and the Rohingya refugees, and the tests per million, which is key because it's per capita, the tests per million, you can see that ultimately the Rohingya have had more tests. Then when you look at the number of cases per million, the Rohingya have had at least recorded, this is very important, it's reported 
um, significantly lower. And then also, finally, when you look at the deaths per million, significantly lower number of deaths compared to overall Bangladesh to the host community. So we see there it's 11.6 per million compared to 26 compared to 51.9. Uh, and these data are, are quite good and they're, they're up to date. Next slide, please. So what is happening? And the Rohingya are just one example of many. We've been looking at what's been happening in Yemen, uh, what's been happening in Syria, what's been happening in um, Jordan amongst Satri and Azra camps. And we're finding, we're finding a lot of um, poor quality data. And the question is, is transmission occurring or is it not occurring in the same amount amongst these populations? We would have assumed it would be, is particularly in high density camps occurring more frequently. And we, to our surprise, have not seen hospitals in most refugee settings and IDP settings being overwhelmed. And the numbers of deaths reported have been lower as well. So are they, is it not being reported correctly? Um, are we missing it? Has it happened already and we've missed it? Uh, and then another area that we're looking at uh, are the indirect effects of COVID-19 because we've seen in Ebola that there's so much concentration on Ebola or in this case now COVID-19 that um, some of the basic maternal child health, uh, basic immunization, uh, malaria, death due to malaria actually increase as we focus on, on Ebola. Um, we have some ideas, but I'm going to go to ask for the next slide, please. So before I get to how can we really know what's happening, we have done some modeling afterwards um, and we've seen a couple clear aspects that some we predicted, some we did not. Number one is that in, in refugee settings, just like in many slums, and we have some data from India, um, the demographics of the, of the population are much, much lower, meaning there are many, many more children and there are significantly fewer proportional uh, of older people. And therefore, even in our original modeling, we understood that the proportion of deaths would be lower amongst these populations, um, just purely because of uh, the age pyramid. And um, the other, and then we, we are seeing similarities, but also uh, COVID seems to be a contradiction across the board, but in many low-income countries where refugees and IDPs um, happen to live, we are seeing that the we're unclear about the transmission, but in many settings we're seeing a very high, a relatively high transmission between 20 to 40 percent of the population have been um, have been uh, infected by COVID, but we're also seeing that the in many situations hospitals have not been overwhelmed and the death rates have not been as high as expected. And there are a lot of theories about this, but at this point, insufficient data. And it could be specifically if there's a higher transmission, but uh, low effects of lower effects of COVID, it may be related to um, previous infections of either similar coronaviruses or different viruses and parasites that may be cross reactivity. There's a discussion about being BCG and being infected. Um, BCG for tuberculosis, of which we do not get in many countries anymore, high income, that one does get in low income countries. Um, and some of these may be protective. Conversely, there are, there in a perhaps, oh no, I need to discuss on this slide, but there's a lot of stigma and discrimination. And so we believe that at least a lot of the official reporting is, is very much underreported. I say I have 26 seconds left, is very much underreported. And that's because, um, of stigma and discrimination in the Rohingya, there were a lot of rumors that if you had any positive cases, they would be removed to, to an island that uh, the Bangladesh government is looking at. So in the future, how can we really know what's happening? We have to improve our surveillance data and mortality data. We have be need better behavioral sur uh, surveillance studies to understand are people not coming forward and why? And we need to do serological studies of which there has been one in the, in the the one only uh, very strong study in the amongst the Rohingya and improved monitoring and evaluation. Because of the time, I'm going to stop there. I did want to just say that there's a lot of concern about vaccinations and equity and ensuring that refugees and IDP do get vac vaccinated. And we're very concerned that this will not happen for a variety of reasons that we can discuss later. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Paul, for a um, really very interesting presentation with lots of counterintuitive um, facts that you are uh, presenting. Um, it will certainly uh, 
raise uh, questions uh, because we don't have any yet in the chat box. Um, I don't answer now. Um, we will discuss uh, after the four presentations. My question would be whether you could say a little bit more about the indirect effects um, of um, this uh, situation. Now it's my uh, big, big pleasure to welcome a very good friend of PDD, personal friend, uh, Mihir uh, Bhatt from the All India Disaster Mitigation Institute, who will talk about the COVID-19 pandemic displacement and the paradox of social distancing related challenges. Over to you, Mihir. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to view Dr. Carlin and of course RLI. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Not a great pleasure to talk about this subject per se, especially the way COVID-19 has displaced large number of people, not hundreds and thousands, but millions out of their work and out of their home in urban areas in India to start with. I'm going to use more the word displacement than migration as it has been used in India in terms of people moving out during the lockdown. And we can talk about that why. And I'm going to show <clears throat> the, the paradox of this displacement, keeping in mind the implication for policy for post COVID-19 world I wonder if there will be a post COVID-19 world. Some things don't have post and perhaps this world post COVID has no post, but we'll talk about that later as well. Let me go to the next slide and um, tell you what I'm about to tell you. One is the sources from where I'm saying what I'm saying, mostly that has happened in India, but also in South Asian cities and other locations. And um, there are six major aspects I'd like to cover quickly in eight minutes to tell you that the policy about the uh, uh, um, displacement needs to be reviewed. So these are the six findings that I have from our work. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to draw from my own All India Disaster Mitigation Institute's work, and that's something primarily I'm doing. I'm also drawing from some of the previous seminars that this very important initiative has taken and has informed my thinking. So I thank them and acknowledge uh, 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 input of various speakers and question that came up from there. And of course the PDD work since its inception and Nansen initiative days has shaped the thinking. So what I say is not original, it's been built on the work that has been going on for quite some time it's a large number of uh, large number of individuals and concrete work on the ground. Next slide, please. Um, first thing I would like the policy to rethink about as far as disasters related displacement is concerned, but perhaps refugee law as well, is I want to draw from the, uh, to say that the whole displacement is not something that you have displacement and you, then you don't have displacement. It's a constantly renegotiating activity. It's not an activity. So at no point it stops completely or no point it has not started. One that we've seen in the pandemic. And we've also seen that using insights on the structures and processes which are supposed to protect people who are displaced, migrants, etc., are hugely hollow in terms of you know, hardly any city of India was able to keep back the workers who were making the cities run and say that, look, we'll feed you, we'll give you water, we'll give you place, you don't have to rush back to your home in the rural areas. And that's the least that we can do. So our structures and processes, which can actually protect displacement or migrant are very hollow, very hollow, and we need to use the insight from the structures and processes to inform the policy changes that we need to make so that these things doesn't happen again. Thank you. Next slide. Um, I also want to emphasize that we have found during the pandemic period that there are two conceptions of displacement and mostly the focus has been on the present, the displacement as it is now, 
that it is very hard to understand the present if the pre-displacement and post-displacement conceptions are not looked at. And most policies are addressed to displacement as it is now. And we have seen again and again, especially some of our recent work, very interesting work with IDS Sussex and Bombay University of Bombay IIT in terms of Sundarbans that is happening, that displacement has very much pre and post and which determines what happens now. And that is something we need to look at in the policy far more uh, carefully than we have seen before the pandemic has taken place. Thank you, the next slide. Um, <clears throat> I also want to emphasize from some of the work in Mumbai urban areas that has done and some of the successful work by the municipal corporation, the state authority, uh, and also some of the struggles that some of the polyvans, for example, where IIT Bombay and other local organizations were working. And, um, uh, and what I have observed from the work that uh, they have been doing is that urban areas and camp situations, especially post pandemic, well, uh, during the pandemic lockdown has given a lot of signals for indigenization. So how do you turn displacement, offer the space, offer the uh, facility, resources, opportunities to find different meanings and applications of displacement as people are doing displacement themselves? And we don't need to invent it. There are hundreds of examples of that across the states and across camp situation in India, also perhaps South Asia as well. So that's a suggestion for the policy implication to see that, to see the policies differently. Thank you. The next slide. Uh, the displacement typologies, I think we need to again relook uh, in the following ways. And the list is a bit long, but I'll give you an example that um, there has always been displacement and you know, before the law scheme, and that was the traditions of displacement. And what how the displacement in some cases helped transform for good, and in many cases now is getting transformed for bad. So what is it that we need to change in our policy so that the transformation of the traditional ways of displacement, which are not being taken over by the state or the authority structures continue, and we don't actually stop there. Uh, um, next, please. Um, there are two areas which are especially very clearly came out during the uh, displacement um, of the lock uh, during the lockdown and also subsequently, and that is the community spaces and public landscapes. So the real we have to relocate displacement, taking into account that community spaces are available but not necessarily controlled by community, and the public landscape is public but is privatized by the state itself. So in that kind of situation, how does the relocating of displacement takes place and what policy changes we need? Next, please. Um, and then I would like to suggest that um, the policies need to look at far more carefully the role of urban settlements than generalize them across types of settlements because cities have really failed the uh, uh, migrant workers who are working in these cities, and they were not really migrant, they were working for 30 years. So, I mean, when do you stop being a migrant and when do you, you know, actually belong to that particular city? And in a one day and next morning, you just walk out of your house, empty pocket, go back 600 kilometers walking to your, so when does that kind of, uh, uh, um, displacement stop and what are the insights that we have gained from this particular experience also identities of people who are being displaced and how that plays out and not consider all displaced as one or several or a few categories and the exchanges that takes place between displaced and other displaced next please so i'd like to sum up by obviously saying that we need for the policy purpose research for roadmap and action roadmap as well. And if you know these six, seven seminars tell us that, that would be very useful, maybe in the form of a roadmap, maybe in a publication. Uh, Dr. Cantor, maybe a book if you wish, and time and resources permitting. Uh, 
But um, I do think uh, that radical rethinking on renegotiating displacement as far as policies are concerned is very much important. And it has to be radical in terms of at least two ways that anybody who's displaced will continue to enjoy universal social protection. And second, anybody who is displaced will continue to enjoy uh, universal basic income. So these are the two, I think, somewhat radical ideas the policy should address. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, very thought provoking. Uh, maybe you um, could mute yourself, you have an echo. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, very thought provoking uh, presentation. I remember you uh, contacted me about a year ago on these uh, issues, and I've seen how much your thinking has advanced. Uh, not for now, but when you're coming to the discussion. What I would be uh, interested in is, uh, because some of our audience might not be that familiar with um, the Indian situation and the displacement of the migrant workers, if you could then elaborate a little bit on the idea of um, displacement as a renegotiating, renegotiated activity and apply it to the uh, concrete and specific situation. Thanks. We're now uh, turning to um, Emmanuel Mibioso from the uh, Institute for Security Studies uh, Africa, which is not joining us from Africa, from New Zealand, where it's in the morning. We very much appreciate um, your participation. Uh, Emmanuel will uh, talk about migrating as a safety net in the times of disasters and epidemic. And I think it's really follow up, following up very well on what we just uh, heard uh, from India. Over to you. Sure, thank you very much, Walter. Um, I think the I'm going to start by by saying that we're going to try and dispel one of the really common um, myths that, that we hear quite a bit when we talk about climate change and climate driven migration. So the common narrative is that climate change is going to lead to mass migration, uh, mass international migration. We have representation at the Geneva Security Conference, and it was some so it was something that I followed, and it was something that was brought up multiple times um, from very high level and very powerful people. Um, but in fact, the evidence is that is not that it is overwhelmingly local, including major urbanization. So, climate migration is going to drive in is more likely to drive individuals leaving from um, places that are that are impacted by climate change um, as opposed to whole groups. So as opposed to whole families or whole, whole village, villages, it's, it's going, it already has um, very circular properties to it. So people want to stay home. So people are, are um, more likely to come home at different seasons. Um, it's, not, it's not as likely to be a permanent or a mass move in that, in that respect. It is absolutely an important adaptation strategy. I mean, this has really been the case since the beginning of time where humans have been you know, adapting to changing climates by moving. Um, it include one of the one of these ways is that it really it allows people, it allows people to stay and adapt in place as opposed to moving. So families are able to spread their risk to diversify income to acquire new skills and even technologies to bring back. Um, immobility is what I'm going to be mostly focused on. So this is a far more common outcome um, that is not getting enough attention. So migration, especially at an international level, is very expensive and climate change is in fact decreasing these migration capabilities. So the poorest people are definitely the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and their livelihoods are going to decrease as the effects of climate change increase. So we talk about the poverty trap. So these are people who are unable to move um, because of the impacts of climate change as opposed to mass migration. Um, next slide, please. So COVID, has, um, in addition to being a health crisis, has also been a mobility crisis that has had a very dire effects worldwide and that we should learn from. 
So as everybody will know, there's been over 11,000 mobility restrictions across 226 countries on all continents. Uh, meanwhile, the drivers that push people towards migration are converging and they're compounding. So when we talk about climate change as a migration driver, we talk about it as a threat multiplier. So it multiplies existing threats. And COVID-19 has had a very similar effect um, in that it is multiplying other threats that are already in existence. And we're also including climate change. So across the African continent, um, some of the ways that the broad strokes that COVID has impacted is that the socioeconomic impacts have been particular, particularly dire. So there's some evidence saying that we've lost 30 years of development due to this pandemic. Um, extreme poverty is a category that is already growing and is, it, and is projected to grow um, in the future. Uh, peace processes have been disrupted, as has governance. Um, this has been further strained by elections that have been delayed or by elections that have moved forward with really poor observance. Um, climate drivers in and of themselves remain very strong across the continent. We've had the locust infestations across East Africa. We've got ongoing drought in Southern Africa. And in the Sahel alone, we've had over 600,000 people displaced in 2020 due to a combination of these factors. So all this to say that COVID-19 has exacerbated the root causes of, of, of migration. Um, and people are unable to return home to most of them because a lot of the conflicts are protracted. And this is a very important point. These numbers continue to go up without ability to go down. Next slide, please. Um, in the meantime, refugee resettlement has hit a historic low in 2020. So we've only seen 22,770 reset refugees resettled out of a total of 79.5. This is the lowest in uh, over three decades or since really since they've been collecting this data. Um, Africa has the highest resettlement needs, but only 7,000 of the people resettled were African um, out of 26 million. Um, and we've seen, a, as I said before, these numbers have gone up. So we've seen a threefold increase in refugees in the last decade and people are unable to return. So only less than 350,000 people um, are returning annually right now. Most are entering into low income neighboring countries where they are accepted um, prima facie, so at face value. Um, but they're kept in camp situations, so they really don't have any durable solutions that they're facing. And in the meantime, these programs are, are chronically underfunded, but we saw even more underfunding in 2020 that we're attributing to COVID. Um, next slide, please. So one of the other outcomes of the immobility that we're seeing is that the lack of regular pathways is driving irregular migration and smuggling. So restrictions historically don't deter people from fleeing. Um, they just drop, push more people into irregular means. So in the early weeks of COVID, while smugglers and uh, mi migrants, people trying to pass, um, the, the onslaught of travel restrictions really slowed things down, but we've seen those numbers go way up, um, almost to regular levels as the year has gone along um, across multiple of, of, the, of the pathways. Um, land and sea smuggling has increased in particular as air has gone down. And we're also seeing new smugglers and new pathways enter. Um, it's very much disrupted the smuggling industry. So we have new actors that are willing to take higher risks with people. And also they're charged. So they're sending people along more dangerous pathways and they're charging many situations. They're charging more money. Um, and we've seen some of that materialize through the Canary Islands and through continued movement through Libya. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, and importantly, I think COVID-19 has really, and the immobility that we've been speaking about has really widened what was already a wide governance gap. And I'm speaking mostly about sort of Africa versus Europe. Um, COVID has really disrupted a lot of the agreements and meetings that would be happening, um, sort of like it has the COP26. Um, and some of the migration agreements, namely uh, the joint AU-EU strategy and the post cotton partnership were already struggling to achieve consensus and move forward. And COVID has really, I think, served to deepen the divergent pri priorities. 
So in Africa, the priorities are very much, including working towards COVID-19 recovery, are really about increasing freedom of movement and freedom of, freedom of trade on the, on the continent and looking at visa pathways off the continent, while the EU continues to push trying to secure border and restrict entries and enhance uh, returns. Um, also, we've seen that the global, you know, I've made an example, we've done some research looking at how it's impacted the global refugee camp uh, compact and COVID has really impacted all four of the objectives um, that we're trying to, that the compact is trying to achieve across the continent and eight of the rollout countries are in Africa. Um, and you're starting to see a real impasse between donor countries and host countries about what the priorities should be and about how it should be implemented. So we've seen some of the refugee and, my, and migration governance, really that gap um, and the priorities coming out of COVID are gonna potentially widen. Uh, final slide, please. So just some things to keep in mind as, I, as we move forward. So the travel restrictions that have potentially helped fight the, the global pandemic and the virus, we really have to consider what are gonna be the long-term cons consequences um, and why they're not safe and sustainable indefinitely because they've created immobility. There's evidence that some countries are using COVID as an excuse to push an anti-migrant agenda. Uh, we've seen that in Australia where they've made cuts to further cuts to the refugee program under the auspices of budgetary constraints, but at the same time, they're continuing to pay for very expensive offshore detention centers. Um, and I think potentially most importantly is have by, you know, allowing by seeing all these border closures and mobility restrictions, have we set a precedent that allows countries to close borders to pre prevent other future threats that may like including climate change um, factors and that are potentially less legitimate. Um, and I'll end there. Thanks a lot. Um for all this uh, very rich um, information and um, showing very well what the new challenges and tensions are. When you were talking about migration and people being trapped and much less able to um, uh, migrate, and at the same time um, talking about um, COVID exacerbating uh, drivers of migration, when we're coming uh, to the discussion, could you a little bit go into the issue of internal displacement or internal migration versus uh, cross-border movements? Um, because um, some of what you said indicates that, in fact, we might have quite a lot of internal displacement or predominantly voluntary migration, whatever, but um, difficulties then for people to cross uh, borders. When we're talking about refugees, then we uh, turn to uh, Nicolas Tan from the uh, Danish uh, Institute of Human Rights. And he will tell us how COVID-19 has impacted on refugee law policy and practice. And I guess this will be very much from a European perspective. So very well complementing what we just uh, heard. Over to you, Nick. Thank you, Walter. I'll just try and uh, share my screen. Is that working? Excellent. Thanks so much to David and Adela for the invitation. Um, uh, today I'm presenting a quite short article uh, forthcoming in the International Journal of Refugee Law uh, written with my co-author Daniel Geselbash, uh, an Australian academic. And what we've really tried to focus on are global north, not just European, but global north state responses to the pandemic in that first half year. Uh, so uh, it, we have a, we, we stopped our research last fall really. And we're focused very narrowly, I think, on how the right to seek asylum has fared in Australia, Europe and North America. And, and when I talk about the right to seek asylum, of course, uh, as our previous speaker mentioned, I'm talking about the right to cross an international border and apply for protection and have your protection claim heard. 
So in my eight minutes, I'll assess the impact of COVID-19 on seeking asylum in 2020, briefly mention the impact of the pandemic on resettlement, and finally try and make some reflections on how the post-pandemic world will look vis-a-vis -vis re uh, refugee protection and the right to access asylum post-pandemic. So what we saw initially, of course, was a, a whole flurry of border closures, declarations of states of emergency, and essentially the largely suspension of the right to seek asylum in these destination states in the global north. And this is what Heaven Crawley has called COVID-19 as a sort of the great amplifier. So by way of example, of course, uh, in Australia, it became near impossible to seek asylum. The sea route to Australia has been shut down for many years now, but some, some asylum seekers have been able to fly to Australia on valid visas and apply for protection. The COVID-19 travel restrictions prevent asylum seekers from entering Australia. Um, there are exemptions and exceptions to this rule, but compassionate or compelling grounds uh, on humanitarian grounds is not one of them. And of course, we saw the US uh, go down a similar path, announcing travel restrictions on the 20th of March, 2020, that allowed border agents to deny entry to almost everyone crossing at the southern border. And so we saw the US CDC uh, authorize the immediate deportation of un undocumented aliens arriving from Mexico. And our data shows that an estimated 96 minutes only was used to review an individual's claims and then deport them. Um, moreover, uh, around a thousand unaccompanied children were deported, some as young as 10 years old. The legal basis for this order was of course, the Public Health Service Act, which authorizes the suspension of entry of persons to the US, where there's a serious danger of the introduction of a communicable disease. And the only very narrow exception to this blanket rule were claims under the Convention Against Torture, where an asylum seeker could make a reasonable and believable claim of a fear of torture. Uh, our data shows that by about 1st of August 2020, 105,000 individuals had been returned to Mexico under these rapid expulsion procedures. And between March and May of that year, only two asylum seekers who entered the southern border were allowed to remain under this Convention Against Torture exception. Of course, it's worth mentioning that now the Biden administration is in fact re-establishing uh, some form of territorial asylum in the US. In the EU, we saw COVID-19 precipitate external and internal border closures and initial suspension of asylum procedures and further restrictions in the Mediterranean. So as a result, what we can see here is that asylum applications dropped to just about 8,000 in April and 10,000 in May of 2020, down from 34,000 in March and 61,000 in February. And interestingly, you can see that while we have seen an increase in asylum applications since those first early months, it has not reached the original levels of before the pandemic. Quite promisingly, the EU Commission recommended that border closures uh, include exemptions for asylum seekers and most states in fact followed uh, this uh, recommendation including Austria, Denmark and Sweden. However, in other states the right to asylum was initially suspended or at least curtailed. In Spain, France, Netherlands we saw the suspension of asylum procedures and in Hungary most concerningly we've seen a declared state of emergency that has effectively suspended the right to seek asylum for the foreseeable future. Further restrictions were placed to block asylum seekers attempting to cross the Mediterranean. So we saw Italy, Malta and Cyprus close their ports for almost all boats, preventing the disembarkation of asylum seekers rescued at sea. Malta used private vessels to detain asylum seekers or return them to Libya. And in the Eastern Mediterranean, Greece used lifeboats to, in pushback operations to Turkey, all under the guise of public health exceptions. So in sum, what we saw in the first month of the pandemic were these restrictions associated uh, with COVID-19, making it virtually impossible for asylum seekers to travel to another country in order to seek international protection. As the previous speaker mentioned, there has been a significant uh, impact, uh, detrimental impact on resettlement. Uh, resettlement programs last year were suspended globally 
and even refugees accepted were forced to wait. As was mentioned, only 22,000 were resettled uh, in total last year. And you can see just how few that is in relation to international practice previously. Now, more promisingly in this area, the, the EU has renewed its focus on resettlement through the new Pact on Migration and Asylum. And the Biden administration in the US has announced a return to 125,000 resettlement places per year. So I'd expect this to climb up. What lessons do can we draw? What lessons can we draw from the first year of the pandemic vis-a-vis -vis the right to asylum in the global north? Firstly, there's a real danger that some of these temporary measures, these exceptional measures, may harden into permanence. We've seen after the 2015 European migration and refugee crisis that many of the Schengen border controls have remained in place some five or six years later. Secondly, there are clear signs that some destination states are in fact exploiting states of emergency and the pandemic itself to limit access to asylum. The US is perhaps the most egregious example of this, but also I'd be very concerned about Hungary at the moment. And of course, importantly to note, we have seen some softening of these hard borders recently with the gradual lifting of border closures and I hope the resumption of resettlement in 2021. UNHCR's data shows that promisingly 81 states currently do make exceptions for asylum seekers despite existing border closures or restrictions. Nevertheless, 57 states remain entirely closed to asylum seekers globally. To round off then with some reflections on post-pandemic protection, we can say that the global, the, the pandemic has at least temporarily extinguished the right to seek asylum in many global North states. And the question is what strategies can be adopted to revive it post-pandemic? Firstly, strategic litigation in both domestic and international fora will have an important role to play to roll back some of these exceptional measures taken during the pandemic. But strategic litigation alone will not be enough. At the heart of the demise of the, demise of the right to seek asylum is of course a crisis of solidarity among governments. And we see a sort of competitive mindset where states seek to divert asylum flows to other jurisdictions. So broader commitments to solidarity and responsibility sharing are required to try and counter this demise of the institution of asylum. And importantly, coordination between states, including provided by the EU and UNHCR to lift these restrictions and allow access to asylum. We believe resettlement and complementary pathways do have an important role to play in the international protection regime um, but this highly discretionary policy that can be turned on and off like a tap shows that it is not enough. States have unfettered discretion as to whether they resettle refugees and who they accept under their programs. So to reinvigorate the right to seek asylum, states of the global north must lead by example and respect the right themselves. And there are great examples of good practice here. Germany, Sweden, Canada, as well as Canada and Colombia leading the way. The question is, of course, which states will be able to rise up to the challenge in this post-pandemic world? Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Nick. Um, again, um, lots of uh, food for thought, lots of facts. Um, one initial uh, question, of course, you have shown how um, numbers of applications went down, how resettlement went down, but in a way, um, we had overall reduction of human mobility. Um, and many think that outside the asylum context, um, mobility, air travel, tourism, etc., uh, will uh, resume very quickly once this is over. Uh, do you think that uh, we'll have a similar trend of catching up in the sense that um, once the situation normalizes, then we will have big numbers of uh, asylum seekers, which then of course might reinforce what you said, uh, that some of the temporary measures uh, might uh, become uh, more uh, permanent. Uh, with this, um, thank you so much uh, to all the speakers. We uh, can move uh, to um, our uh, discussion. I've uh, already um, asked um, some questions. Um, 
I see in the chat box uh, one question by uh, David uh, Cantor. Not yet from participants, please feel free to ask questions, short ones, long ones, whatever. But uh, let's start with the first round of answers. And uh, as uh, David uh, suggested, uh, let's um, use the same uh, order of uh, speakers. And let's start with uh, Paul. Paul, over to you. And please feel free also to comment on what you heard from, from other uh, uh, panelists. Wonderful, thank you. Um, perhaps first starting with your question, Walter, in terms of the indirect effects. Um, we have heard consistently from many NGOs and, and, uh, and governments that the numbers of people coming to the clinics, uh, both in, in many situations and probably all over the world have significantly reduced. Yet in many high income countries, um, telemedicine has been able to be used as, a, as, as an alternative, but that's not the case in, in many uh, middle and low income countries and in particular in conflict and forced displacement. Um, as I'd mentioned previously in the Ebola outbreak, in fact, in, in both West Africa and then in DRC, more people died at, as an excess due to malaria that should not have died uh, if the Ebola outbreak had not occurred. Um, that's number one. Number two is what we need to be able to do is to, and we're in the midst of doing this, but it's, you know, the data are not always so easy to get access to and also the quality, but we're looking at pre and post pandemic data looking at everything from um, uh, births with uh, skilled birth attendants to looking at antenatal care, looking at incidents and deaths of the, the most common causes of, of deaths, uh, pneumonia, diarrhea, malaria in some of these settings, and trying to better understand these indirect, um, what we call the indirect effects, which really means excess uh, deaths that in theory and, and morbidity and mortality that, that are occurring that would not likely have occurred if COVID uh, was, was not, uh, if we didn't put the preponderance of our efforts onto COVID. Um, that's not to say that uh, we shouldn't be, we have to obviously be able to address uh, COVID in both the preparedness and the response. On the other hand, and, and one of my slides probably uh, I didn't point it out, but when you look at Yemen and parts of Syria, it's clear that when you're being bombed and uh, when you have very little to eat, COVID and some of the restrictions on COVID may not be people's priorities. They may have other priorities. Um, and then finally, just in terms of what David uh, asked in the chat, I would we, we have been thinking about what are some of the longer term effects uh, with respect to the, the pandemic. This would be more hopeful than, than reality, but I'm hoping um, that we've, we have seen now the classic response is to, for international NGOs and the UN to send in um, expatriates to be able to work with governments, but in many times really take control of a response. We saw that in Ebola. We're not seeing this in COVID because it's a pandemic and countries are taking care of themselves before others. Um, and I, I am hopeful that we can look at the response and the localization, how governments and how national NGOs have responded. Um, and while there may not be sufficient data yet to say how they did respond because of many of the issues that I've mentioned, I'm hoping that in the future, this the, the push for localization that we've talked about before, meaning localization, meaning that uh, governments and national NGOs will get more funding and more and increase capacity, and that the um, in the long term the um, amount of money going to the UN and international NGOs, as well as the response, there'll be a shift. I'm not expecting a massive shift, but at least a smaller shift to be able to show that governments and national NGOs have the capacity to do this and we don't necessarily need to respond in the same way as an international community as we have always responded in the last couple decades. I'll stop there, thank you. Thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, may I uh, follow up with, with a question? You um, showed um, that uh, in comparison uh, to Bangladesh, uh, to the host community, 
the uh, situation uh, in Cox Bazar in the in the camps is relatively good, always relatively. Um, and you mentioned some of the uh, factors that might influence that, like um, um, more young people, etc. Uh, I am presently um, a member of the uh, expert advisory group to the high level panel on internal displacement. And um, what we hear there is, and that's not related to COVID more generally, that yes, the situation of IDPs is bad, but very often they um, get the attention of the humanitarian community, the international community, whereas uh, state services for local uh, communities are so much weaker. Might this be a factor, the presence of um, the humanitarian agencies? And, and what does it mean in, in terms of, of policy approaches? Yeah, no, that's a, a wonderful and astute question and comment. Um, firstly, I would say that I don't believe all of the, uh, let's say the reported data is likely an underestimation. Um, so on, when you look at that website and the data that I had uh, circled in red, I'm by no means, there's, there seems to be no reason to believe that the deaths uh, would be significantly lower amongst the Rohingya in the camps compared to Cox's Bazaar. So I think there's a significant, I think we think, many people think there's a significant underreporting and IOM and uh, ACAPS did a, at least a community-based survey there and they many of the Rohingya mentioned that they did not want to report deaths due to COVID and even go to the clinics because, as I mentioned, well, number one, they would automatically be isolated and removed from their family if there were suspected COVID cases. And number two, there were a lot of rumors about uh, that they would be relocated to, to the island. And so I do think I, I, I am very, I want to be very uh, clear to everyone on, on here to say that I'm not convinced by any means that, and there's no reason to think that refugees uh, in terms of the, the hospitalizations and deaths would be significantly lower than surrounding populations. Um, and interestingly, so we've done a bunch of studies in the past and there's no question that refugees in, in camp-like situations often have better outcomes than the surrounding communities for exactly what you said, the international community responding. I don't think that's necessarily the case in, in the COVID, uh, in this pandemic, because the response was different, right? Money has been removed in many situations. And one of the colleagues um, here showed how WFP has been dramatically reducing food. So um, the levels of care may have been similar to pre-pandemic pre or reduced a little bit. And I, so I don't believe that in this situation, it's because of the strong international response for refugees and not in the surrounding populations would have had the same effect here because of the pandemic and because everyone was so concerned with their own countries and their own response and people could not travel. The expats and others could, could not travel. Thanks a lot, uh, Paul. Let's move uh, to uh, me here. There are uh, several questions also now in the chat box. Please uh, look at them. Over to you. Thank you. Um, both addressing the question that uh, Nicholas Maple, you have uh, put forward in terms of urban settings and services. And of course, EQUA, who's done so much, including recent climate charter for humanitarian action, which does mention migrants and workers, the second version and congratulations on that and your question. I'd like to give a bit more of, of paradoxes of um, the Indian situation, but it's also South Asian situation to a large extent. I can't say that with such confidence because, because I'm uh, um, based in India, so I can say more about that. And one of the first thing ever is never ever such large number of citizens have walked out of their cities in such a short notice with such empty pockets with nothing to look forward to on their foot millions millions look at the ILO report and that millions of people and that has not changed any policy any rule 
any regulation whatsoever, urban, non-urban, basic services, et cetera, et cetera, either nationally or globally. So that's a huge paradox, you know, millions of people. Mao Zedong had a long uh, march and a whole country, China, came out. We had a salt march and India got its freedom from the British. This march made no difference whatsoever, either policy or politics for that matter. And that's something worth, worth looking at and remember, one. Second thing I'd like to uh, uh, point out is that the migrant labor, labor movements have always brought about social change, economic change. And here, the labor itself was moving, physically moving, and has neither brought about economic change or social change, leave aside any rules and policies changing place. And that's another paradox. And this perhaps hasn't happened in history that we know of. Third paradox, which is very important, is that we've heard of footloose capital, that capital moves from one place to another and globalization and all that. We've heard footloose technology, but we haven't heard of footloose labor and here for the first time, we've turned labor into a footloose commodity for the production of the objectives that we have. And that's a very unusual situation. We can't blame it to pandemic, of course. This has been happening and pandemic made it show that actually that happens. The fourth paradox that is so important is that the migrants or the displaced population, the workers and the citizens, and all three of them are kept in three very separate distinct boxes. For some reason, you cannot be one person who is all three simultaneously and the laws applies to them accordingly. So if you are seen from the migrant point of view, your worker status doesn't really matter because that's somebody else's uh, business. Your citizenship doesn't matter. That is also somebody else's business. And as a result, these three, three sort of silos has created what I would call the has actually shown the, the fault line of our democratic processes that how democratic rule, laws, and regulations do not have an integrated citizen at the center of them. And that's something pandemic has made clear. It's not new that has happened before. And the last point I'd like to make is um, um, is about the whole whole justice aspect of citizens to work, workers, displaced population. There is so much of judic, what is the sort of right word? Juridicalizing, if that's the word, but so much of that is turned into something which is judicial, as if justice can only be gained judicially. All the other justices are put at a, at a periphery. And that's what something I picked up from uh, Nick Tang, you were also mentioning, um, globally that has happened. So in short, what has happened in pandemic, and that is not new as Equise rightly say, is that um, the fundamental freedoms that any law, refugee law or any law, that it should be protecting, that has been put behind. And pandemic has shown that vulnerability that, do, that the fundamental freedoms can be taken away so easily and so quickly without any resistance whatsoever from any structure or any processes. And here we are, nothing has really changed as far as the fundamental freedom of a migrant, worker, citizen is concerned. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um... As a lawyer, uh, of course, I know that the law is always lagging behind realities and reacting to new challenges after the fact. Uh, just uh, for uh, our audience, uh, there's a very interesting article in the uh, latest, um, most recent issue of the Refugee Survey Quarterly by someone called uh, Malavika Rao. And the author um, exactly says what you said, is silos made it uh, so difficult for the migrant workers, made it so difficult to address their needs. And what the author is um, calling for is really to integrate these kind of situations into India disaster management uh, legislation. Okay, uh, Emmanuel, there's um, one or two questions also in the uh, chat box. Box, over to you. Yeah, I've accumulated a few notes here. 
Um, I'm going to answer your question, Atle, because you asked the question about um, refugees versus IDPs, and I'll just give the numbers. So across the continent of Africa, IDPs absolutely dwarf um, refugees in, in camp. So uh, there's 18.5 million IDPs and then 6.3 million refugees. Um, and as I said in my presentation, those are from you know the combination of drivers. And I think absolutely with respect to climate drivers, you're going to see uh, more IDPs than you will uh, international people crossing international borders. And we would expect that to be the same uh, continentally. Um, in reference to David's question um, about whether or not we're seeing new normals and whether or not there'll be a sort of re resurgence. Uh, we do quite a bit of smuggling sort of monitoring um, among potential migrants. And there's definitely signs that there will be a surge. Um, I think it's it can be specific to certain corridors over others, but there's definitely sort of evidence that there's quite a few people on the more labor migration side who are or who feel quite strongly that the economic needs of some of the sort of global north or uh, wealthy countries are going to be really strong and that the demand for migrant labor as soon as the travel restrictions go down um, is going to be quite high and they're anticipating that there'll be a short window before that closes so there will likely be along some of the corridors um, a pent up demand and people who are trying to sort of get there first is something that we're picking up on um, before they expect a reactionary response from the countries and then um, they expect the, the border controls to be tightened. Um, you know, I've written here that the, it, the, there has actually been, a, and this speaks to a couple of the points, but one of the things that's happened in recent weeks is that there has actually been another Rohingya boat um, that was found adrift after the engine broke outside of India and the two countries between it departed from Cox's Bazar and um, between Bangladesh and India there's a dispute about who has responsibility to take them in um, which again goes back to I think it was Jerome's point where um, these are some of these practices and also India has, uh, I think, detained roughly around 200 uh, Rohingya refugees with the intention of returning them, presumably to, to Bangladesh. Um, so these are practices that were already in place and that people, countries are definitely using COVID as a, uh, a cover to be able to reinforce them. I think that's one example. Um, I've written here funding, and I think, um, again, this speaks to sort of practices. As I talked about really briefly in my presentation, um, funding of refugee situations across Africa has, is chronically, chronically low, but in COVID we saw that um, uh, go down even more. Um, I think before anybody else was on this call, David was speaking that, you know, the UK has also lowered their overseas development assistance. So this is something that I think that we're going to be facing across development. Um, and I think, yeah, I've sort of lost my train of thought. So I think I'll, uh, I'll sign off from now and add some more later. Thanks a lot. And finally, Nick, I've been, um, there are a couple of questions um, in addition to my question in the uh, chat box. Over to you. Thanks, Walter. Um, look, maybe to address your question first, you, you asked, will, you know, when mobility resumes, won't asylum seeking mobility also resume a sort of bounce back? Um, and in a way, we, I guess, we are seeing this at the US southern border currently, um, sort of influx of. Uh, I think it's around 125,000 in the past months who have been waiting in Mexico under the former Trump administration policy now being given access to the US. So that is a sort of bottleneck situation. On the other hand, I think uh, there, there will be some states where their control apparatus has been so honed and developed and uh, is, is so highly developed uh, at this stage that there will not be a bounce back and we could see of course, there will always be asylum and always be asylum seeking, but um, we could see a sort of protracted set of 
lower numbers in these destination states, at least for this year, I'm certain, and possibly well into the future. If I could also pick up on Jerome's question, who asked about um, the historical examples of such controls and that these restrictions are nothing new, but also how this could be leveraged uh, in, a, in a post COVID world. I have a few points for you, Jerome, and obviously you're the historian, so you would have the sense of the historical continuum far better than I do. But of course, I've mentioned legal challenges. I mean, we're in an exceptional period, states have done exceptional things. At some point fairly soon, we need to start challenging and questioning when do these exceptional periods begin to end and when are we back into normal law and policy making. Secondly, I think, and this goes also to David's question, from, from the international refugee regime's perspective, the pandemic came at a particularly bad time. The Global Refugee Compact was passed in December 2018, the Global Refugee Forum was held in December 2019, and then just a couple of months later, the pandemic hits. So there's this real question about whether the momentum, for lack of a better word, can be rediscovered on the GCR. How many pledges from states and other actors have been derailed by the pandemic? How many can be saved, retailed, and put to work? And finally, just as a, a sort of thought for you, Jerome, I mean, for some states, of course, the pandemic has been a sort of asylum reset, I think. We've seen exceptionally low numbers in states like Australia, areas like the EU. Could the drop in migratory pressure on the international protection side be a chance to reset and perhaps improve existing asylum policies? Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, if I'm uh, correct, then we... Um have answered all, all the questions uh, that uh, were uh, raised. Um, of course, we could continue our discussion, um, for instance, on um, what you just said, Nick, um, bad moment for the refugee compact. I think it's the same for the uh, global compact on migration and some of the other uh, international uh, processes. But we should uh, move towards um, um, finishing, uh, winding up. Uh, on my side, I really would like uh, to, to thank all the four speakers, extremely rich, and I think it really um, expanded our perspective on relationship uh, between um, this pandemic and human mobility. But that's certainly just the beginning also of um, a vast research uh, agenda, because um, it is something that we have not been really looking at the um, interaction between um, these uh, health issues, pandemics, um, epidemics. There has been work, Ebola was mentioned by you, Paul, but there's so much more as we have seen uh, today. In that sense, um, I hope um, that uh, today's uh, discussion um, has been the beginning of um, further work, uh, further interaction among ourselves and among many, many others. I would like uh, to really use this opportunity on behalf of the Platform on Disaster Displacement to very sincerely uh, thank um, Refugee Law Initiative and David Cantor for uh, this uh, great uh, cooperation uh, we had. We have been working together on other issues in the past and we will continue to work uh, together, David, uh, on um, issues in the future. Um, just uh, in our preparatory meeting, uh, we had been already discussing about some work we might do together on um, glo uh, a mapping of um, the uh, implementation of uh, the Global Compact on Migration regarding issues uh, that are related to disasters, um, adverse effects of climate change. Uh, on the uh, PDD side, um, we will work a lot in the next uh, two, three years at regional levels. Big project in the Pacific on human mobility in the context of uh, climate change. We are um, also having a similar project in Western Africa um, that is um, funded by France. We we'll also work uh, in the IGAD region there on free movement of persons now, but they integrated a um, disaster climate change Article in there into their new protocol uh, 
on free movement of persons. So lots of opportunities. Thank you so much, David, and over to you. Well, many thanks, Walter, and many thanks to our four speakers. I must say that I feel um, ever so slightly guilty vis-a-vis -vis our speakers for asking you really to look into your crystal balls and try and predict a very uncertain future. But it's been fascinating to listen to the four perspectives that you were able to share with us. And I thought some excellent points also in the discussion as well. So allow me then to draw proceedings to a close by just very quickly making three final points. The first of those is to remind everyone that all six sessions of this series will be available shortly on the Refugee Law Initiative and Platform on Disaster Displacement websites. Please do feel free to revisit them, to share them and to use them. They're really there as a learning tool for all. Secondly, for those who are keen to continue engaging with the Refugee Law Initiative, please have a look at the wider projects and events that we run and which you can see showcased on the website. In particular, I'd like to invite you all to participate in the upcoming Refugee Law Initiative Annual Conference in June, which will take place for the first time this year online, and it will be open access as well. For those thinking of presenting, the call for papers closes at the end of this month, so you've got a short window if you want to put in your proposals. Before then, though, do look out for the thematic webinars on internal displacement, which are led by researchers in Africa, Latin America and the Middle East that we'll be supporting through our internal displacement research programme over the next month or two. Finally, I'd just like to again reiterate my thanks to our four fantastic speakers today and of course the many other speakers during the series for sharing your expertise and insight on the very topical questions that this series has interrogated. It's been great also to see so many engaging and thought provoking questions and comments raised by other participants today. So many thanks to you too. Perhaps the greatest debt of thanks though is to our partners, the Platform on Disaster Displacements, who, with whom we convened the seminar series this year, Walter, Atle, Sarah. It's been a real pleasure to work together on this short project and I, I very much look forward to continuing the collaboration again in the future. Until then, Thanks again and goodbye, everybody. Bye bye.